what I worry about is if the West comes in and says, hey, don't do these bad things. And China comes in and says, hey, wait a minute, here are these good things you can do, and we will help you do that. You know, there's a view among most sort of foreign policy establishment leaders in the U.S. that China is seeking to be the global hegemon, um, just like the U.S. has been the global hegemon. You know, look, at the end of the day, I think China will become very, very much more powerful than it is now. There's all this discussion in the U.S., oh, you know, the China, Chinese, Chinese economy is stagnating and the birth rate and all that. I, I don't buy that. China is going to continue to grow significantly. The Chinese economy will be double in, in 25 years. I'm, I'm, I'm completely convinced of that. And, and so no matter what you do, China is going to be a major player in the world economy. It's going to have a lot of power. And I don't think that we can do anything about that, nor, nor, nor in some way should we do anything about that. What, what I worry about is not so much that, but that that rise. And I think this is what Amer a lot of American leaders think is, is that rise comes at the expense of our advanced industries where we, we really lose a lot and China gains a lot. We've long had had export restrictions on for many countries, including the Soviet Union and others, where we think that the technology could be used for creating weapon systems. Where it gets a little fuzzier is where we're putting export bans on technologies, particularly like semiconductor chips. And no one can deny that one of the effects of that is to hurt our own companies. Our own companies now have fewer sales. That means they might be, they probably will invest slightly less in research and development and developing the next generation of chips. So in a way, there's a phrase in the U.S. or in the West called cutting your nose off to spite your face. We're cutting our nose off because we're not. We're, we could be selling more. I believe the same thing with AI and, and cloud computing restrictions. That's not to say we should go whole hog and go crazy. So, look, ultimately, China is going to be able to make those chips, and um, so I worry that we're not really getting any real benefit. Maybe they're, we're throwing some sand in the in, on barriers in the road for a little bit, but not really fundamentally making a big dent. Well, the old Washington consensus was really around this idea that we would spread this kind of uh, free market, open trade, fiscal discipline to all these countries around the world. And if they just kind of copied us, they would develop quickly and, and all. It was a response to some countries being so far off the, you know, like Brazil being totally protectionist and Argentina running up massive, massive budget deficits and then their currency falling and in massive inflation. Okay. Countries need to have good macro state stability in their policy. You need to have somewhat openness to trade. I get all that. The problem with the Washington consensus today is it really doesn't give countries a path by which they can grow their economies. It's just don't do these bad things and these wonderful things will happen. And the problem today is that countries know that that's not enough. They have to be more proactive. And what I worry about is if the West comes in and says, hey, don't do these bad things. And China comes in and says, hey, wait a minute, here are these good things you can do. Uh, you can build up your infrastructure. You can you can help train your workers. You can you can in, in, install these really good technology and we will help you do that. Um, what I worry about is then it sort of puts countries in a, in a like, yeah, I like that one better. I'm going to go in that direction. And so it just leads a lot of countries to then go and say, well, we, we really like the Chinese model. Um, and we're going to be more aligned with with China. And, and I think the reality is, you know, the Washington consensus was never a good model for developing countries. So I think as long as the West keeps sort of proselytizing this market based initiative, market based view, we're just going to lose countries because they're like, I don't I don't want to do that. I want to I want to follow Korea. I want to follow China. They look at China and they go, I really like that. I mean, you look at China 40 years ago, incredible poverty, you know millions of bicycles and no cars uh, and now it's credible you know evs and all this stuff so i think washington and the west has to come up with another model for how to grow uh, and that's what i would say reject the washington consensus but i do think a lot of countries look to china and and say how do i grow my manufacturing how do i become moving up the up the value chain the way china has so um and also the other thing about china i would say i give china credit for this is they they put a lot of effort into this. They they really reach out to a lot of developing countries and say, what can we do? The U.S. doesn't do that as much anymore. To be fair, there's no real sort of coherent 
strategy for how to respond to China. It's very ad hoc. Now people are worried about electric vehicles. Um, there's this obviously this focus on on export controls. So it's not really systematic. There's no real sort of overarching plan or strategy. As I said, the main thing I would do before is, is I would I would make it harder for Chinese companies that are systematically not playing by the rules. I would make it harder for them to get access to our market. Um, if Chinese companies are playing by the rules, I'm like, great, um, no, that's, that's not a problem. And, and I do think that that level of nuance, if you will, is, is what's needed in the U.S. debate. It, it tends to be either let's do nothing or let's go overboard and kill TikTok and do everything in 100 percent tariff. And I think there's a difference between where China is currently competitive, including being an innovation leader or close to the lead and areas where they're not, but they're catching up. Robots is is, is in that second category. Um, the, the world's leading robot producers still are in Germany, Sweden, uh, Switzerland and Japan. I would argue, though, China is catching up very, very quickly uh, in robots, robotic innovation. They're certainly uh, leading in terms of just putting robots in factories. So I just wrote a report on Chinese robotics capabilities, and China is adopting way more robotics in manufacturing than we are. And their robotics R&D is very, very far along. And so they have this center. I'm sorry, I forget the name of the town, but it's a you know beautiful campus and robotics companies are all around it and the government's putting in money to do research on robotics. Anyway, so those kind of things, just to be clear, I, I give China a lot of credit for that. Uh, that's a good way to compete. You're competing on just, can we get better? Can we innovate? And, and I don't think ultimately, uh, there's some people in the US who would just say, well, we don't want China to do any of that. China's doing very well there. I think obviously telecom equipment with, with Huawei and ZTE to some extent, Electric vehicles, I think, are, uh, you know, it's not clear where, chi if, if China is better than, like, say, Tesla, China, like BYD and other companies, but they're certainly, they're certainly pretty far advanced, and, and they're coming at it with a low price. I think in a lot of areas, China is still behind. I think, for example, on biotechnology and pharmaceuticals, China is still behind the West, but again, making significant progress. So I think what's likely to happen in the next decade, you know, China went from went from very much an agrarian and kind of not very good manufacturing economy up to a very good manufacturing economy. It's pretty long standing when at a point where countries are competing on sort of lower skills and lower prices. I don't think that's an attitude anymore in the U.S. Oh, made in China. It's not very good. That perhaps was when China was at the lower end of the, of the production scale and they, their products weren't as high quality oftentimes. That's not what's happening in China now. I think the next step that where China is going, I believe that they will get there, is really getting a lot better in these more complicated, complex production systems and technologies. So, you know, I, I, these glasses I, I, I'm wearing, you know, they're from China. Uh, they're great glasses, reading glasses. They're super cheap. They're not very hard to make. Uh, but making uh, an airplane, incredibly hard to make, uh, making medical devices, really high end, complex medical devices, really hard to make. And I that's where China is going and that's where they want to go. And, and there's a lot of, I think, advantages China has there. Uh, one is um, you're graduating a significantly higher number of engineers and scientists than we are. If you look at the Chinese um research articles that, that, you know, published scholarly scientific research articles in terms of the most cited in the world. So, you know, anybody can publish a research article, not very hard, uh, but getting one that's cited a lot means it's really important. And if you look at what uh, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, ASPE, has done, they did an analysis of Chinese, uh, uh, the trend in Chinese scholarly publications and, and how well cited they are. It's amazing. I mean, I think that's the other thing that people are not fully appreciating in the West is that this, how well the, the science base of China has improved. It still has a long way to go, but Chinese science has gotten significantly better uh, and engineering has, has been strong. So, you know, I, I, I think China has, should, should be quite proud of, of what, it, what it's accomplished there.
Uh, so again, it's really across the board, uh, but overall, I, th- I, I do think China is making uh, fairly robust progress in a lot of these areas. I do think one of the advantages that China has now is that the if if you look at the opinion polling that some international organizations have done about sort of the attitude of the population towards science, technology, growth, innovation, I do think China has an advantage in a way because I, first of all, China is more hungry, like, hey, we still want this. And then secondly, I do think there's a more pro-innovation attitude among Chinese people. I was just talking to somebody yesterday on a call and they, they were talking about how they were in a, a restaurant in maybe Shanghai, a robot delivered the food. I do think that's an advantage, you know, China, as long as China keeps this sort of, hey, we want to be innovative, we want to keep pushing the envelope. That's a plus. You really need that as a country to be able to uh, keep innovating and, and improve. So I, I do think that's one thing China has that's uh, really uh, an advantage over us. I think there is a space for sort of co-prosperity there where, you know, we could acknowledge, of course, China is going to be, you know, a, a much bigger economy in 25, 30, 40 years. And as part of that, have a much bigger role on the global stage. It's more, is that going to come with, you know, our significant weakening and, and harm? So I do, I do think that's, that's, that's one of the other factors that's going on. When you look at international trade theory or uh, international economics, one of the reasons it's supposed to work is because of market forces. And a key market force is when a country's products become less competitive in global markets, either because of domestic inflation or their companies aren't as productive, the natural market adjustment process is for the currency to fall. And then when you want to buy, I don't know, you know, an American uh, machine tool, you pay instead of paying, you know, the equivalent of a, you know, hundred thousand yuan. You only pay ninety thousand yuan, and and now you're more likely to buy it. And conversely, uh, when we would buy, uh, say, a, a Chinese-made um, uh, wind turbine, uh, we would pay instead of instead of ten thousand dollars, we'd pay eleven thousand. Problem is in the U.S. that we have this this, you know, I almost I would call it an ideology. Uh, it's an ideology of a strong dollar. Um, and it's weird because the U.S. is very market oriented. We want the market to determine many things except the value of the dollar. Now, I think ultimately the U.S. dollar is significantly overvalued uh, because we're running a, tr- a trillion dollar trade deficit. So the dollar needs to fall 20 percent minimum, 30 percent minimum. The reason it doesn't fall is because it's the reserve currency. Uh, and so everybody in the world trusts it and they all put their money into dollars. And then the other problem is that the U.S. Uh, elites, uh, the, 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 all the economists, the, the financial system, Wall Street, they love a strong dollar. And the national security establishment likes a strong dollar. And so some of the tensions would go away if, the, if, we, uh, if we were having more balanced trade with China. Again, there are many, many factors, but I think that's one of the factors. And a weaker dollar, so let's put it that way, uh, would do a lot for um, making the U.S. more competitive. I'm not at all optimistic that U.S. policymakers will do that. They, there's a, there's, they're allergic to that. But ultimately, the global financial markets might do it uh, because our budget deficits are so bad. Our national debt is so big. Eventually, currency holders around the world might say, well, we're not going to put the money into, uh, into into the dollar as much anymore. We might put it in the euro or we might put it in the RMB or wherever that might be. The Biden administration, they won't support a weaker dollar or a market adjusted dollar. I do think a Trump administration might do that. Part of the reason I say that is is to to, to start advocating for a, a market adjusted dollar is a very bold thing to do in in, in U.S. politics. You know, they, whoever whoever advocates that will be will be criticized a lot, uh, and there will be a lot of political pressure. Um, it's not clear, if, obviously, if Mr. Trump will become president um, again, but if he is. Uh, there's some talk about perhaps Mr. Robert Lighthizer, who was the head of our trade uh, negotiating body, might become Treasury Secretary. I think if that happens, he would advocate for a weaker dollar uh, because he he understands that very well. Um, so I think a a dollar adjustment is more likely under a Trump administration. We we might see that, but I think under a Biden administration, we'll just see the the, the status quo.